Mondays with Coach Mel. My name is Melanie Potok, and I'm a speech language pathologist who specializes in feeding and picky eating and helping children learn to love food. And tonight, we are going to be talking about how to teach a toddler how to swallow, which might sound kind of silly. Isn't swallowing just a natural reflex? Well, it is. It's a natural reflex that we're born with, unless there are some complications at birth or some um, neurological difficulties, of course. However, for most kids, swallowing is a natural, reflexive, almost, I don't even know what's going on, kind of behavior. And therein lies the problem, is when kids turn into, oh, I don't know, maybe 13 to 18 months of age, and they're starting to explore new foods, so often they tend to hold the food in their mouth or spit it out. And if you say to them, sweetheart, swallow, they don't really know what that means. So as a speech language pathologist, I want to take the knowledge of language and early play and feeding, and let's tie them all together and teach these littles how to swallow purposely and propel that food back and have it go down to their tummy. So here's how you do it. There are several ways that you can teach a swallow, but my favorite way is with puppets. And what you wanna do is start with a sleeve that is fairly tight on your arm. Now this particular one happens to have a little bit of um, extra across the hand, you know, so often our athletic wear and our sweaters have these little thumb hooks, I call them. You don't have to have that. You could certainly just have a really long sleeve, that's fine. But these definitely help with this technique because you are going to put a puppet right on top. I'll show you in a minute how to use a sock puppet for this, but I have to show you what I found at Walgreens the other day. I'm a little too excited about it. Um, check this out. <laughs> I know, I'm laughing. <laughs> it just is too much. These are, I think this was $1.29 at Walgreens, and they have all different ones. And look, this guy has teeth. He could be a dinosaur, an alligator, whatever you want to make a bee. And all I did is cut a little slit right here so that the kids I'm working with can feed him and send that food right down to his belly. Let me show you how this works. I happen to have some celery here because I'm all about teaching kids to eat vegetables. And this is just some play food that I picked up for, gosh, I think it was 99 cents at the dollar store to have a package of like 12 different vegetables. And it, it you know, when, the, when you're holding the alligator and the kids are feeding the alligator, make sure that you're really taking advantage of them practicing chewing, especially over on their molars. And once he's chewed it up, then just have the kids, look, push the food right down his throat and remember to close and swallow. Well, the food is actually inside your sweater. Now, I don't know if you can see this right here. And I like the kids to help move it down. So I'll tell them, oh, make it go down to his happy tummy all the way down. And that food will end up right about here. I'm going to try to move this so you can see the bulge. There you go. There it is in his belly, right? That's his happy tummy, we call that. Okay. Then as you start to add more and more food, I happen to have a lemon because, you know, crocodiles love lemons. And as they chew, and these, these rubber puppets are so flexible, this guy can swallow a whole lemon. <laughs> I know it's hysterical. And then just help them send it down the sleeve. It's a little tricky for me because really the kids are normally pushing this down and I'm holding him still. And that lemon will go right down again. Let me show you. See how it's starting to make his belly bulge out? And they can poke there and feel it. 
and we can talk about how it goes down to his happy tummy. Oh yeah, he swallowed it. It went down his throat to his happy tummy. Let's talk about that for a second here. I'm talking with my hands like a typical speech therapist. And <laughs> um, when you're working with children who are 12 to 15 months, keep in mind that in terms of their language development, they are just starting to um, perhaps present what demonstrates some single word use. They are understanding a lot more than what they're able to say. But we want to model really simple phrases for them. And as you move closer to two, you can model a little bit longer phrases. So for example, here's my friend again. I'm having a little trouble putting him in the camera. There he is. Hi. <laughs> well, when, let me grab some more food here. When you go to feed this little guy some corn, all right, make sure that you're using the um, just the right amount of language for that child's cognitive ability. So if they are a 12 to 14 month old, it's going to be really simple words, probably just one to two at the most put together. So that might be corn, chew, 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 push, and then let the kids say swallow, swallow, and have it go down once again. Can you see? There it is to their happy tummy and they can poke it and say, yeah, it's in their tummy, tummy. And make sure you're tapping their tummy and you're showing them your tummy and tapping too. And the beautiful thing of, as we start to move right at about 15 months of age, kids have a pretty good understanding of basic body parts, both on themselves and on mommy or daddy. So things like tummy or belly or whatever term you might happen to use, or mouth is very familiar to them. It isn't until they get a little bit older that we start getting into more abstract body parts like a wrist, but that doesn't really pertain here. And that's why you can teach kids as young as, oh gosh, oh, 14 to 15 months, what a swallow really is. Now, if you want to continue to use your puppet here, and you start, you're working with a child who's closer to say two or even two and a half, then make sure you're modeling phrases that are a little bit more advanced. So it might be, he's going to eggplant because once again, alligators, crocodiles, eggplants, you know. <laughs> well, make sure that instead of maybe saying chew, chew, go ahead and use some ing endings. He's chewing, he's chewing, he's swallowing. Ah, it's going down, down, down. So many opportunities for language. Down to his belly. Look at all that food in his belly. Look, he's so full. I have to show you what else I found while I was at Walgreens, and then I'll show you how to do the same thing with a sock puppet. So they have all different characters, like I said, and they're like a dollar twenty-nine or something. Check out this guy. <laughs> I love this one. So once again, look, I just cut a hole right there, and you can put as much food down there as you want, and it'll all end up in the shark's belly. Now, if you want to use just a um, a regular, like an athletic sock, I stole this one out of my husband's drawer. This is how you do it. You still want to have a long sleeve, ideally with the thumb hook, but you don't have to. But you're going to pull your sleeve down. I'm sorry, guys, I'm trying to find just the right angle here. And when you are making your sock puppet, let's go this way. There we go. When you're making your sock puppet, right, you know, you can take your sock puppet and you can put some little eyes on or some uh, felt teeth, a tongue, whatever you want to do. What you're going to do is have the sock come all the way down and then you pull the sleeve up 
over that. And you can hook the thumb if you want, right? Okay, now when you feed him, it'll go right down the sock and still lodge in his belly right here. So you'll have the same effect if you can't find some of these other fancier puppets. This works great. And you can make it with the kids, which is super fun. And, you know, I do this all the time in feeding therapy, and then I just leave the puppet with the family, or I um, make it with them when we have therapy together. The main thing to remember is that you want to be sure to pause when you cue. So, chew, chew, give them a second to really process that information and let them play. This is the optimal time for pretend play to emerge for a child. And then as they start to push down and have the food go down into the belly, make sure that you're having at least three seconds of what we call pause time. So, down. It's in his belly. Give them a chance to process what's happening. Two other ideas for you, and then we'll take some questions. So feel free to start typing in your questions, and we'll address perhaps some issues you're having with your picky eater, or I know we have some feeding therapists joining us tonight. If you want to talk about some of your cases, we'll certainly cover those as well. I just wanted to mention two other ways to help a child learn about swallowing. Well, First of all, every time you go to take a drink, point right here on your throat so that the kids can see that swallow happening. Another trick you can do is have them touch your throat and you touch theirs and have them feel that swallow. But what I really love to do is I'll often take a sticker and I'll put it right here so that when I do swallow, it will actually go up and down and the kids can see the sticker going up and down. So lots of different ways to teach the same concept. Let's see if we have any questions about teaching kids to swallow or perhaps other issues with picky eaters. We have a lot of people here tonight, which is great. I'm just taking a look here at the questions. Uh, Anybody have any questions about kids that they're working with or any of the um, topics I've done recently on Mondays with Coach Mel or questions about my new book, Adventures in Veggie Land, 100 Ways to Teach Your Children How to Love Vegetables. Lots of easy and fun activities here. So Katie asks, my kiddo's picky, but tonight she ate cod and liked it. Like the fish? That's awesome. <laughs> Should I confess that cod is a fish? She's six. You know, that kind of gets back to um, the topic of should we hide vegetables in food? Should we tell kids what's really in food? A lot of parents ask me that same question, Katie, when it comes to should I tell them that hamburger is actually from a cow? You know, a lot of it is the way that you present it and what's comfortable for your family's food culture. So depending on how you want to communicate it, the most important thing is that you keep your energy really even keel about it, almost matter of fact. So, for example, if you were making brownies, it's not like, Katie, you would say, well, my brownies have corn oil in them. You know, we just don't say things like that. Likewise. I think if you were going to mention it's a fish, you might maybe mention it later or casually in that current conversation. Like, yeah, I really love cod too. I love fish. Another fish I love is salmon. It's pink. And it just it's more in the energy that you project and they should do just fine with it. I think that's a great question. Likewise, if we're talking about hiding vegetables in food, uh, speaking of the brownies, I had a family ask me the other day about a recipe that I had for black bean brownies, and they were saying, what if I tell the kid there's black beans in there? He won't eat it. Well, we always want kids to trust what we're presenting and what, more importantly, what we're making with them. So the key is to have them in the kitchen making it. But if they're not, and you happen to be making the brownies the night before and then serving it the next day, it's absolutely fine to be enjoying those brownies with them and casually say, gosh, you know what? This is a new recipe. I didn't think I was going to like it because it's actually got black beans in it, but these are really yummy. 
that's a beautiful way to approach it. In my book, Adventures in Veggie Land, I make a point of saying that it's not about hiding food. It's about getting kids in the kitchen. And even every single vegetable in here, there are 20 in all, they include a dessert. And gosh, um, the other day I was making the, the chocolate fondue that includes pureed asparagus. Kids don't know that chocolate fondue doesn't have pureed asparagus in it. How often do kids make chocolate fondue? They just think it's another part of the ingredient. But the more, more importantly, they're interacting with asparagus. Let's see, I saw another question go by. Oh, Elizabeth asks, what about anxiety and feeding? Elizabeth, kind of a broad question, so I'm gonna to try to answer that for you, but if you need more clarification, just comment again for me. Um, you know, as a feeding specialist who works with a lot of children who have difficulty eating, I have to say that with, gosh, I can't even think of an exception, every one of my clients has a level of anxiety around trying new foods. Now, sometimes those kids come to me because they had a choking episode or they had an allergic reaction, which sparked that fear. And naturally, those, uh, those episodes are also really frightening for the parents. So they pick up on each other's energy as well. But if it's also a child who's hesitant about trying new foods because their sensory system doesn't allow them to interpret information that well, things feel just a little overstimulating or perhaps understimulating, and they don't get the feedback they need in their hands and their mouth and their body overall, those kids are often anxious about new foods because it just doesn't feel right. And as they get older, they wonder, why is everybody else okay with this and I'm not? They definitely see that there's a difference there and that creates more anxiety. But for my older kids, the ones who are, gosh, five, six, 10, 12, 14 years old, I have kids on my caseload that literally will break out in hives if you put new food in front of them. And they'll start to breathe heavily and they'll get really, really stressed out. And we talk a lot about that feeling of anxiety and that it's not about the food, it's about the feeling. There are many, many reasons why we feel anxious. I feel anxious, um, well, today, as a matter of fact, today I got called in for jury duty. And when I got there, it was supposed to be a three-day trial. It was a 10-day trial. And I could not convince the judge that I can't take 10 days away from my clients. They need me and I need them. And I was a wreck. I thought, how am I gonna do this? And my husband's out of town. Fortunately, by this afternoon, I got excused and I'm not on the jury. But I was really a wreck and I had to practice some of my strategies doing some deep breathing while I was sitting there in front of the judge and being questioned by the attorneys. And I had to tell myself, I'll figure out a solution to this. Um, I use those same techniques with my kids. And we talk about the difference between feeling excited and feeling anxious because a lot of children just think that that feeling they have in their gut, those butterflies, is the same thing. It really is okay to be scared. It really is okay to be anxious. So understanding that that is something we all go through and that we certainly respect the fact that the child is feeling that at that moment and that we're going to help them through it and we're going to be okay. I hope that answered your question. Uh, Katie says, um, thank you for touching on allergic episodes. If you go to my YouTube channel, remember to subscribe so you always get a new video in your inbox via your email. I just posted one about an hour ago. There are a few different videos there about food allergies and one specifically about a child who had to eat a new food that she was previously allergic to but was in an experimental study at Stanford University. And because of that study, she had to eat a little bit of egg every single day. Well, she was over her fear of it, but just the texture of egg made her gag. Yet she had to ingest it in order 
for this new experimental study to continue. So she and I worked together with some strategies to help her learn to eat eggs. So just look under um, gagging and you'll see a few videos about that, especially when it comes to kids with food allergies. Elise asked, any tips for kiddos, he's two and a half, that have issues with pocketing food? Is there any correlation with difficulty swallowing and tongue strength and the pocketing? Absolutely. Now, not for every child, but for sure, when a child is having difficulty swallowing, as a, a feeding specialist and a speech language pathologist, I'm taking a look at oral motor strength, stability, especially around the jaw and the musculature, and looking at uh, obstacles like a tongue tie or even a lip tie can influence swallowing. I'm looking at the, um, the motor skills in, in addition to physiology, but also coordination. So assuming, Elise, that all of that is fine and that this is a, just a child who has learned to kind of pocket like a little chipmunk and now has so much food in their mouth, they can't figure out how to get some of it onto their tongue and swallow. That's not uncommon. Let me give you a few tips. What you want to do is start with a very small amount of a preferred food. Ideally, cut it into the shape of a cube because the kids can feel a cube better in their mouth. Have them chew it over right here on their first molar and then have them take a drink with a skinny straw, not a wide Starbucks straw, but a fairly skinny straw, a small sip and wash it down. Talk a lot about swallowing and the food disappearing and going down to their belly, et cetera, just like we were just going over. Um, and when they, if, if they're still having trouble with those pea-sized amounts, then I would really suspect an oral motor difficulty. But if they're not, you can gradually go to bigger amounts. Now, another thing you have to consider is that what about the child that is stuffing because, let me see if I can find something to show you with. You know what? I'm just going to pretend that my phone is a sandwich, okay? Kids who stop when they're eating, say, a sandwich, they take a bite and they put it in their mouth. Take a bite, put it in their mouth. Take a bite, put it in their mouth. And the step that they're missing is take a bite and tear it away. You and I take a bite and tear it off the sandwich and we maybe hold the sandwich while we're chewing or we put it back down on our plate and then we go for another bite once we've swallowed. There is a specific technique that I want to encourage you to find on my YouTube channel. Just look for the word chipmunks to talk about those kids who pocket. And I have a whole video there showing you some strategies to teach a child how to bite, tear, and pull it away rather than bite and stuff, bite and stuff. They're missing the step of pulling it away. And that video will walk you through it. Let's see. Ah, uh, Brooke says, um, oh, this is so nice. She said, thank you for these short video series. These are some of the most helpful 30 to 60 minute tidbits that continually help me learn. This particular Mondays with Coach Mel video series, I post on my YouTube channel as well. So they'll be on the My Munchbug Facebook page and they'll also be on YouTube by tomorrow at the latest. That way, if you subscribe to my YouTube channel, it will show up in your email the next day. But the best part is having all of you here live so that you can ask questions and we can really learn from each other. Let's see if there's anything else before we say goodbye here. Oh, Lisa says, I'm working with a 17-month-old with an adjusted age of 14 months. He still has a peg tube. He's coming along with his feeding, but has no desire to drink. We've tried using a straw while controlling the flow and open cups, and he refuses both. Lisa, can you let me know, can he suck purees off a spoon? Just reply in the comments here. If a child can suck puree off their finger or off a spoon, that's the prerequisite to learning to drink liquids through a straw. So if he can do that, assuming he can, 
If you go to my website, melaniepotok.com or mymunchbug.com, I'm going to put it in the comments here for you when we're all done, and click on video course, pull that down and you'll find my free toolbox. You're going to find 10 steps to teaching a child how to drink from a straw. And the difference is I use purees. Kids who have trouble drinking from a straw when it's a liquid have trouble controlling that thin liquid. If we use a, pure, a puree, it's essentially a thickened liquid and um, they can control it a little bit better. Also, a couple tips for you. Make sure that, oh gosh, I wish I had something on my desk to answer this question a little bit better. Um, I do. Hang on one second. You're going to watch me disappear. This is not <laughs> I happen to have it in my purse because I'm a feeding therapist and naturally I carry cups in my purse. <laughs> okay. These are little ketchup cups that I admit it, I stole from the local fast food restaurant. And I use these a lot to teach kids straw drinking. You can also use baby food jars. And all you're going to do is cut down a straw. Let me show you right here. about like that. Now, remember to look at my 10 steps to straw drinking and assuming you've already gone through those 10 steps. Another hint would be take a very small cup and a very small straw. Fill this up with a super smooth puree and have them drink from this. But a tip is to take your gloved finger, get a little puree on your finger and just put it around the outside of the straw. That way, when the kids go to put this in their mouth, They'll feel the puree and it's almost like sucking off a spoon and it'll cue them to start sucking. But when it's a super short, ah, I dropped my straw. It's a super short straw, like that tall. They barely have anything to prime. If you put a really tall straw in there, they won't be able to suck it up all the way. That requires too much effort. So make sure it's a teeny tiny short straw. Let's see if there's anything else. I think we're almost done here, but I'm happy to answer another question. Let's just double check. I'm just scanning through. Oh, he had a tie corrected. That's okay. Um, oh, Elise mentions that for the child she was just speaking of, he will try to chew things like baby carrots, but won't swallow and the bits remain in his cheek. Elise, one of the strategies that you'll find in uh, adventures in veggie land is to blanch those vegetables and you'll also see a YouTube video on this let me walk you through it baby carrots are exceptionally hard for kids to swallow especially those who are having some of the troubles you're describing and it's because when you chew on them they break up into little shards and they end up right here in that lateral sulci that you're describing Rice dried, like not a wet rice, but just a basic white rice is another culprit, as is chicken breast, because it's not a very moist meat and it kind of turns into cud, frankly, right down here. So here's what you want to do with the baby carrots. Get a pot of boiling water, pick three or four baby carrots that are all about the same size, put them in your boiling water, and let them boil for about three minutes. This is called blanching. Take your fork and just poke them and make sure that you can poke into them, but you know they're still going to have a crunch. Scoop them out, stick them right into an ice bath or a bowl of ice water. That will stop the cooking. Then what you're going to do is pat them dry. And now that extra moisture that's been drawn into the carrot, that provides that what I call a slip factor or the moisture to help them propel it back and swallow. But another tip is to cut those into cubes like we talked about a few minutes ago. Start with a cube. I'm talking about a cube the size of a pea, like the kind of carrot cube you'd see in uh, vegetable soup for kids, right? Tiny. And have them start there. If that goes well, you can progress to taking a baby carrot and cutting it into four long strips and have them hold it over here and chomp on it that way before you get to the big carrot. So always starting with small pieces with lots of moisture, perhaps through blanching, and then pro uh, progressing from there. It's a very common problem. I'm glad you asked that question. I think that may be it. 
I think so. <laughs> Allison uh, Beard McGuire, who, who I met several years ago, she and I keep in touch, says, oh, you taught me that trick, works really well. <laughs> Thanks, Allison. Okay, everybody, so be sure to um, stay in touch with me and pay attention to our Mondays with Coach Mel because with April coming up, it, of course, is the month where we celebrate our kids with autism. So I'm going to be doing a lot of videos about cooking with kids with autism in the kitchen. We're going to be doing a special one, actually, about cooking with children with Down syndrome and how to take some special considerations in for those two populations. And I'm always here to answer any questions about kids, food, and family. So I'm so glad that you joined me. I hope you have a wonderful week and look for this on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks everybody. I'll put those links in the comments for you. Bye-bye.